Hi, I'm Dr. William Starzak, and in this video, I'm going to talk about rapamycin, or more commonly known as sirolimus. This is a medication that was discovered in a soil bacteria from a soil sample found on Easter Island, and it's pretty cool. When this molecule was first discovered, they didn't know what it bound to. And when they found what it bound to, it was an entirely new molecule that we had no idea existed. And it was present in pretty much every cell in the body and in every living organism. Even molds and fungus have this molecule present. And this molecule ended up being named for rapamycin. It's called the molecular target of rapamycin, mTOR. And mTOR is described as being kind of like a, a regulating switch between growth and repair. The basic principles being that when we're in full growth, our immune system can be overactive and we're also accumulating debris. It's kind of like if you're building a deck, you're probably going to make a bit of a mess. Once you're done building the deck, you're going to clean that mess up. So that's also what our body's like. When we're fully tilted into growth, we tend to wait on the cleanup. And we see this in all of our cells, this tendency of our body to accumulate debris, kind of a, a pile of junk. So rapamycin activates this molecular target of rapamycin, mTOR, and it causes the body to then shift into repair mode. But what is rapamycin for? Why am I even talking about it? Well, it's really one of our best candidates for longevity, the prolongation of life. We've already seen in animal models that it significantly prolongs life in rodents, in mold, in yeast, in flies, in dogs. It also decreases age-related disease. We've seen this in the animal models, but we've also seen this in humans. So why doesn't everyone know about it? Why isn't everyone taking it? That's what this video is about. So sirolimus, rapamycin, has been really instrumental in transplantations. Before this medicine, transplants just didn't work. And once this medicine started being applied, all of a sudden transplants started working. And for this reason, the medicine got classified as an immunosuppressant, which isn't really the whole story. But this is part of the reason why it's not more widely used, is because of this classification. Generally, for the FDA, whenever something is put into a certain class, all the risks associated with that class are applied to that medication. So for immunosuppressants, the risks are bacterial infection and increased risk of malignancy. But neither of these are significant for sirolimus at longevity doses, and I'll talk more about that later. There's one other reason why rapamycin hasn't been widely applied in longevity, and that's because in certain animal studies, they found that if an animal was given this, like a mouse or a rat, over a prolonged period of time, and then they were given a glucose load, a sugar load, that they would spill glucose into their urine. So it was erroneously concluded that it could cause diabetes. But this phenomena is a well-known phenomena. If you, you, we see it in fasted animals. So if you have an animal fast or a human fast for a prolonged period, and then you give them a sugar load, they'll spill sugar into their urine because they're conserving their glucose for their brain. So their cells have become insulin resistant in the rest of their body. So they don't take up the glucose. So that glucose is left available for the brain. So this is actually a really positive thing that this was found in the rodent models because what it means is that rapamycin acts like a fasting mimetic. It's mimicking fasting without the need for fasting. So that's one of the really awesome things about it. And additionally, these rodents, they lived longer. They had fewer disease, uh, the ones that were spilling glucose into their urine. So it was not a bad thing. Now, circling back around to those other two risks of being in the category of immunosuppression and having the risk of increased risk of infection or increased risk of malignancies applied to it. As it's been researched, we actually see the opposite. So rapamycin is approved for multiple different types of cancer. It decreases the risk of cancer in the transplant recipients that take it. And in these models, these rodent models, where there are mice that are bred to have a lot of malignancies, a lot of cancers, if they're given rapamycin, 
it dramatically reduces the cancers they develop and there's no substance more powerful to reduce that. So pretty cool. Um, now when we're looking at infections, well, it, people getting transplants, they have a lower risk of CMV if they're taking rapamycin, which is a virus that can affect transplant patients. Cancer patients also have a lower risk of infection if they're taking rapamycin. And the same thing is true with animal models in rodents uh, and dogs, lower risk of infection with taking it. There are some positive studies looking at using it to treat autoimmunity like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, because what it's doing is it's, it's normalizing the immune system. It is decreasing hyperactivity of the immune system and bringing it to an, a normal level and that ends up helping in a lot of conditions to improve immunity. So for a normal healthy person taking it for longevity purposes, in my mind, the risk of infection is vanishingly small. The um, other important thing to know is that Rapamycin's dosed differently for transplant patients versus people using it for longevity. The way that we dose Cyrolimus for longevity is different than the way we dose it for other things. So for preventing transplant rejection, we dose Cyrolimus daily and titrate the dose up to achieve a certain trough level, a certain like minimum level of Cyrolimus in the system to ensure effectiveness. But when we're dosing for longevity, we don't dose daily. We dose weekly or every other week. We pulse it. And the reason for this being that the effect of sirolimus persists long after the medication is stopped. This was shown in animal models where you could take rodents in the first third of their life, give them rapamycin, and when they're aged, they actually will have a lower risk of Alzheimer's and they'll live longer, even though they stopped it after the first third of their life. This effect persists. And the, the strength of the effect is not about keeping a stable, low blood level. It's about hitting a high peak and then letting it go. So you take it once a week at, say, 8 milligrams or every other week at 14 milligrams. And so you get a strong signal and that signal persists in the body. It actually alters physiology um, in rodent models we see for the rest of their life if they take it for long enough. We've seen over the years a lot of very compelling studies. Studies that demonstrate significant increase of life in animal models. Where rodents that are bred to have an extra short lifespan, you give them rapamycin and they'll live three times as long. And then more kind of normal animals that don't have particular deficiencies, you also see a life prolongation, not to the tune of three times, but still significant. So a lot of people are hypothesizing that we'll see this in humans as well.